Hello, once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do another video today talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. Uh, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to declare the name of Jesus. I ask that you use this video to reach the lost souls and to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. Open eyes and ears to the truth of your prophetic word and the soon return of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Alright, first of all, real quickly, uh, I'm getting into the really, really, really busy time uh, in my career in the golf business. So uh, it's March, and so my videos are going to be done at all different times of the day. I, I, I like to have them done by early evening, but uh, I'm doing this one first thing in the morning, trying to get ready before I go to work. Because uh, a lot of nights now, I won't be able to start the videos until about 9 o'clock at night. So, uh, But they're going to be all, I'll get them out as, as best I can. And I appreciate your patience, and I appreciate all of you allowing me to uh, to spend 45 minutes or so with you every day watching these videos. So uh, thank you, and I and I ask that you share all the videos that speak to your heart and help me get the word out. And uh, thank you to all my subscribers, and welcome to all the new ones. And uh, also, again, I do read every one of your comments, and uh, I, I try to respond as quickly as I can uh, to all of them. Uh, but uh, it may be a little bit more delayed as we move into spring. Uh, but I'll keep up with it as best I can. All right. Uh, a lot going on again. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was here, is here in the United States. He spoke at the uh, APAC uh, conference today. Uh, but I, I want to get into some other news stories, and, and I'll talk more about Netanyahu uh, and some other news stories today and, and uh, of course, tomorrow after his speech. But uh, this first news story I want to cover today is actually a really interesting news story I came across this morning out of the Jewish press. Uh, great news. If, you live in, uh, if, you're, if you're a Jew and you live in Jerusalem, here's a, here's a ruling. Court rules. Police must allow Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount. Let me read that again. That's a very important, very, very important headline. Court rules, police must allow Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount. Praise God. Uh, the police must ensure that Jews can pray on the Temple Mount. That was the ruling of Judge Malka Aviv in the case of Yehuda Glick, versus the Israeli police. On a number of occasions, the police have banned Rabbi Yehuda Glick from ascending up to the Temple Mount. Rabbi Glick told JewishPress.com that he regularly leads, tour, regularly leads tour groups up the Temple Mount, and not being allowed uh, up prevented him from earning a living. Rabbi Yehuda Glick took the police to court and sued for damages on Sunday. The court decided in Glick's favor. But the bigger victory was the court's criticism of the police's action actions toward the Jews on the Temple Mount, and the explicit ruling that the police must ensure that Jews be able to pray on the Jewish people's holiest site. I've been waiting for this day for a long, long time, and of course, no doubt, the Jewish people have been waiting for it a lot longer. The police may choose to appeal both the financial award and the ruling, but the question remains, until the appeal, will the police respect the court's ruling and ensure that Jews can pray on the Temple Mount. In November, an Islamic terrorist shot Yehuda Glick four times at close range in Jerusalem in a failed attempt to assassinate him. Uh, the terrorist was killed the next morning at his Jerusalem home when security forces tried to arrest him. Last week, U.S. Congressman Dennis Ross went up to the Temple Mount and found himself harassed by the Islamic extremists on the Jewish holy site. Uh, so again, let me just say that one more time. The court ruled that the Jews must be allowed to pray on the Temple Mount. Guys, there will be a temple built in Jerusalem soon for the final seven-year period of time. It is starting to go that way, and then this is a big ruling that the Jews will be allowed to pray on the Temple Mount. And uh, again, I've done some videos recently that 
that indicate that the actual Temple Mount might really be about 600 feet to the south of the existing Temple Mount. Either way, whether it turns out it's where, where, where we think it is now, or whether I believe it might be a little farther south, either way, we know for sure that God's prophetic word says there will be a temple there for the final seven during the final seven year period of time. After the Antichrist declares a covenant with many of Daniel 9.27 and Daniel's 70th week starts, there will be a temple that he will desecrate three and a half years into it. Jesus called it the abomination of Daniel, the abomination of desolation. Daniel 9.27, Matthew 24.15. In Revelation 11.1, John is told to measure the temple of God and leave out the court of the Gentiles, the other court. So uh, there will be a temple. Second Thessalonians 2 also talks about the Antichrist entering the temple and declaring himself to be God. Uh, but the fact that the Jewish people, the, the court ruled that they must be allowed to pray on the temple mount is just a, a great, great sign and a great, uh, great ruling. So let's, let's, I want to share one verse about that real quick. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people or all nations, however you want to word that. Some some translations use the word nations there. But peoples, nations, tongues, Gentiles, or Jewish people, whatever, the whole world, eventually will be able to go to that Temple Mount and pray. Very interesting, these developments. Um, praise God. Let's go to another interesting news story about Israel. Um, it's nice to give you some actual good news kind of news stories for a change, because they're all usually... Uh, about wars and rumors of wars and things. Here's an interesting article on the Times of Israel today. Judean desert blooms lushly. Judean desert blooms lush, lushly. Videographer produces phenomenal clip featuring regions astonishing topography after rainfall. A breathtaking video of the Judean desert in bloom released last week depicts the greenery of the region following an unusually wet wintry season. The video produced uh, offers aerial views of the region's famously rugged topography with its rolling hills and treacherous cliff faces. The Judean highlands stretch east of Jerusalem and extend south past the Dead Sea. Admired by Israelis for its natural beauty, the, re the region is often eclipsed by the much larger and drier Negev desert to its south. The two-minute clip is one of several short films sh uh, shared by this Israeli videographer, I'll, t I'll attach this link into the description box, all these articles, so you can check these out yourself, and there's a video of this. Oh, but the Judean desert blooms lushly. Let's turn to a couple other chapters in Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, and the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 18 through 20. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the chateau tree, and the myrtle, and the olive tree, and the oil tree, excuse me. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together. They that may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Finally, let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, verses 29 to 31. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they shall now shoot forth, you see and you know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. Likewise, when you, when you see these things come to pass, know that, that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The Judean desert is a blooming lushly another sign from our heavenly father 
of the signs of the times. Praise God. All right, now let's get into some uh, less positive stories concerning Israel and their future. Um, again, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for Benjamin Netanyahu, as he's here in the United States speaking about Iran. Uh, it's first story out of uh, Times of Israel. Kerry warns Netanyahu against revealing Iran talks details. Secretary of State concerned that the Prime Minister's speech will include specific information of the emerging agreement with Tehran. <clears throat> Kerry appeared to warn Prime Minister Netanyahu against revealing in his upcoming speech to the U.S. Congress details of an Iran nuclear deal that ruled powers are currently negotiating. While he did not mention Netanyahu by name, Kerry told reporters in Geneva he was concerned by reports that selective details of the deal would be revealed after an Israeli official said Jerusalem knew about the emerging agreement and that the Prime Minister would elaborate in his congressional address. Earlier on Monday, a senior official traveling with Netanyahu said that the Prime Minister would reveal details from the emerging nuclear deal with Iran to uninformed U.S. lawmakers during the speech on Tuesday. We know many details of the, of the agreement being put together, details that we feel members of Congress are unaware of, the official said. According to the information we have, the deal currently taking shape will leave Iran with the capability to build a nuclear weapon if Khomeini will make a decision to do so. Uh, so we've got Kerry uh, warning Netanyahu about disclosing details. So the next article... Right next to it in the Times of Israel today is headlined Netanyahu to inform Congress on Iran deal details. That's the whole reason he's coming here. To expose a speech, or excuse me, to expose a deal that could be very bad, not just for Israel, but for the rest of the world. Netanyahu to inform Congress of Iran deal details. Advisor traveling with the Prime Minister claims Israel has more info about the deal than U.S. lawmakers. Says Netanyahu won't offend Obama in the speech. <clears throat> the official said Netanyahu will reveal some details of the agreement during a speech before the both houses of Congress on Tuesday. We are not here to offend President Obama, who we respect very much, um, said a Netanyahu advisor. The Prime Minister is here to warn in front of any stage possible, the dangers of the deal that may be taking shape. Uh, however, Israeli officials, including Netanyahu, have said the deal being put together is a bad one that will be dangerous for Israel and the Western world. <clears throat> I will do everything in my ability to secure the, our future, Netanyahu said. Um, he describes himself as an emissary of the Jewish people. <clears throat> so, again... You know, Netanyahu is being criticized not just here in America, but also in Israel for trying to protect the Israeli people from a bad deal from Iran, with Iran, who is committed to their annihilation. Um, let's move on. What could be the result of Iran's nuclear program? Well, here's a headline out of uh, Times of Israel today. Iran could nuke New York, Bennett warns Americans. Jewish home leader, party leader, says Tehran seeking to target western cities with nuclear-armed intercontinental missiles. Economy Minister Naftali Bennett warned American TV viewers Sunday that Iranian nuclear ambitions were a direct threat to the West and that the regime in Tehran was developing its missile program abilities with an eye to launching nuclear attacks on major western cities. Bennett, who is Israel's economy minister, um, said that the biggest exporter of terror in the world was developing nuclear warheads and intercontinental missiles capable of reaching New York, London, and Paris. He underscored that a nuclear-armed Iran was not only a threat to Israel in the Middle East, noting that Iran was already capable of, of, capable of hitting Israel with Shabab rockets if it wanted to. Bennett traveled to the U.S. with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over the weekend, to attend the speech, uh, 
reiterating his comments, he said uh, Bennett called the emerging deal between Iran and Western powers an unmitigated disaster that effectively legitimizes Iran's uranium enrichment program. It keeps it creates a path for them to get a bomb in the next few years, he said. <clears throat> <coughs> Uh, we know many details from the agreement being put together, details we feel members of the Congress are unaware of, the official said. So, again, they say that this deal is definitely going to allow Iran to build a bomb if they so choose. And we know that that's exactly what they want to do, and that's what they will do. And they will join Russia and Turkey and Libya and Ethiopia in an attack against Israel... In Ezekiel chapter 38, we can see that's called the War of Gog and Magog, and Iran is part of that regime that will attack Israel. And as Psalm 83 says, they want to wipe out the name of Israel, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. That's the plan, and uh, it's amazing to me that an American president is continuing to negotiate with Iran, who wants to wipe out America as well. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's move on. Embattled Hamas tries to mend fences with Iran. Gaza-based group fell out of Tehran's favor when it publicly backed Syrian rebels fighting Assad. After years of strained relations over the Syrian conflict, Palestinian Islamist group Hamas is looking to mend ties with its traditional backer, Iran. But reconciliation is proving far from simple. However, Iran has been providing Hamas and, with weapons in Gaza. Um, wrongly backing an Assad overthrow, Hamas's exiled leader, Mashal, in 2012, abandoned host Damascus to move his base to Qatar. Um, after reports that Hamas's military wing was helping uh, Sunni re rebels fighting the Assad regime, financial support from Shiite Iran began to dry up. But with Hamas now in dire straits after the destructive war with Israel, officials have begun making overtures, overtures to Iran and its allies seeking to return to the axis that links Tehran, Damascus, and Hezbollah, Lebanon's powerful Shiite movement. In terms of logistics and training, Iran has done more than any other country in supporting the resistance. Iran has always helped us, but the path to reconciliation is fraught with obstacles and it will take time to fully restore ties. Reconciliation between Hamas and Iran is on its way to being realized, but it is going very, very slowly and faces obstacles which ensure it won't be uh, the fate accompli in the near future. Experts say the biggest hurdle is Hamas's position on Assad. It's a gamble on his downfall. Uh, it's a gamble on his downfall. Uh, alienated the movement from downtown from longtime backers Tehran, Damascus, and Hezbollah, in favor of a closer alignment with Qatar, Turkey, and other Sunni supporters of anti-Assad rebels. Now. Let's turn real quickly to Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1. I haven't done, talked about that lately, but here's a prophecy that's just a matter of time before this one is fulfilled. Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, the burden of Damascus. Dema to behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. It virtually is now due to four, four years or whatever it is, a civil war there. Uh, but it will. It is still the functioning capital of Syria, um, but it won't. It won't be soon. And uh, this alignment here between uh, Iran, Damascus, Hezbollah, Hamas, it's going to result in a, in a serious war in the Middle East before long. Uh, but again, Hamas, a known terror group committed to destroying Israel, is an ally with Iran. So is Hezbollah. All of the Psalm 83 uh, nations and peoples are aligned with Iran. They make no bones about it. They want to wipe out Israel. <clears throat> and here's another article uh, out of uh, Rich Shreva today. As nuclear talks drag on, how Iran is slowly encircling Israel. Although they keep claiming they just want peace. 
Tehran, no longer even bothering to hide its aggressive expansion throughout the Middle East, even as negotiations continue. In the background of this week's dual drama of U.S.-Iranian negotiations regarding its nuclear program and Prime Minister Netanyahu's high-profile speech aimed at influencing them, Iran has continued to encroach on its fabric of the Middle East. In the last year, Iran has deepened its involvement in Iraq, aided Yemen's Shiite... Uh, come on. Pop-up ad got in the way, sorry. and facilitated Hezbollah's most expansive deployment in history. Iran has been applying a peripheral strategy against its primary rivals in the region, not just Israel, but also Saudi Arabia. With Israel, that strategy depends on Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Segal of the Jerusalem Center who specializes in Iranian military strategy describes the approach as a pillar of Iran's Plans for the Middle East. Sorry, this ad is popping up again. Uh, I'm going to, again, I'll put this in the description box so you can check it out yourself. Uh, but again, Iran is, is surrounding Israel on several fronts preparing to attack Israel. There's no question about it. Um, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia is mentioned in that article. And last week I did, or a few days ago, I did an article about uh, Saudi Arabia says that they will authorize Israel to use their airspace to attack Iran. Uh, very interesting how everything is developing, coming together. Uh, Tel Aviv protesters seek to overthrow Bibi. I have a very bad feeling that Benjamin Netanyahu is not going to be re-elected. Uh, and it's a, it's a shame because he's looking out for the safety of the Israeli people and the nation. Um, but here's an article out of uh, Eretz Sheva today. Tel Aviv tent protesters seek to overthrow Bibi. Leftist MK's unions pile into Tel Aviv's Rothschild Boulevard. I'm really having trouble with my Google today, guys. Sorry, it keeps crashing. Uh complaining about housing crisis and calling to replace Netanyahu. Protesters have returned to Rothschild and Tel Aviv, but in much smaller numbers than the summer of 2011. Around 150 people gathered Sunday night on busy thoroughfare, with 20 setting up tents to protest Israel's housing, Israel, Israel's housing crisis and high cost of living. Um, since the Prime Minister is only talking about Iran... They realize, uh, the workers realize and understand that the Prime Minister is not worried about their interests or their rights. We need to replace him. They, she added that her party was committed to workers' rights. This is our deepest ideology. We have fought these rights in the opposition, and when we are, we are we're in the government, we can do it properly. Um, people are fed up with living by, with a suitcase by the door. We want ch uh, change. Every, every politician will understand that the public is sovereign, and we have the power, he, he thundered. Um, so basically they are upset over the economy of Israel and want Netanyahu ousted and are worried about a housing crisis. But let me ask these people of Tel Aviv who are protesting. If Iran nukes you, let me make a point here, if Iran nukes you, you won't have to worry about your economy or your housing crisis. Benjamin Netanyahu is looking out for the safety of the Israeli people. And if he is not reelected, and they allow someone else to come in who wants to divide the land of Israel for peace, it's not going to happen, and it will not bring peace. In fact, the Bible says when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. As travail upon a woman of child, and they will not escape. It's very, very important right now that Israel has a leader that will stand up for their safety and their security. Not sign peace agreements that won't bring peace and try to defend against Iran who wants to annihilate them. But it's the signs of the times that we're living in, the Bible prophecies are coming true so fast it appears it just may be where we need to be right now that uh, the Daniel 70th week is about to start. That's where we're at on the timeline. And Daniel 70th week will start with a covenant that will be confirmed. 
and it will set all the final seven year period into, into action including judgment upon Israel praise God they will be saved in the end all right uh Gallup poll Americans support for Netanyahu is soaring unfortunately as I said the support for Netanyahu in Israel where it really matters it does not seem to be soaring but over in America it is and hopefully it'll soar even more tomorrow after his speech Nearly twice as many Americans view Israel's leader favorably as unfavorably. Over at age 50, support has risen by 20 percentage points. The Gallup poll has found that, President, that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's favorable rating among Americans has risen 10 points in the past three years. Uh, the poll shows that 45% of the public see Netanyahu favorably. Uh, just over half that amount, 24%, view him unfavorably. Approval from him among Ameri um, among Republicans and in general improved by ten percent, uh, ten percentage points since two thousand and twelve. Uh, it says even if Netanyahu has seen his relationship with the White House deteriorate because of the speech, it appears to have had no impact on his standing with the American people. However, there are sharp differences between the two parties. While 60% of Republicans view the Prime Minister with favor, compared to 18% who feel the opposite, the Democrats are split down the middle, 31-31. Independents' favorable ratings of Netanyahu are twice as high as their unfavorable ratings. But as I said, it really doesn't matter if the American president is going to step uh, all over Israel and stab them in the back, force them into bad deals. And it doesn't matter if the American people like Netanyahu if the Israeli people don't re-elect him. Again, we need to pray for Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli people. Uh, one more article I want to cover today. Um, very good article I saw today. It says, when it comes to Iran and Israel, Obama is way off target. This is out of the Jerusalem Post. Couldn't agree with him more on that, uh, but I can't think of one target that uh, Obama hits. Our uh, enemies chant death to America and burn American flags at public rallies in Iran. The unelected mullahs in Iran must be having a hearty laugh this week, enjoying the spectacle of the Obama administration falling over itself to drive a wedge between America and our vital Middle East ally, Israel. For a wartime president who campaigned on pledges to end conflicts in the Middle East, his latest actions suggest that he may be just the man to keep them burning, and to even ignite new ones. In Washington, a firestorm of controversy has been sparked. But not over Iran's continued intransigence, its stonewalling of international arms inspectors, or even its expanding sphere of deadly influence in the Middle East and gross repression of civil rights and human rights. Instead, the, prime, the president's minions are playing politics to discredit Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu before he addresses a joint session of Congress. The, absurd, the absurdity of the rules... I cannot believe the trouble I'm having today, guys. Sorry, let me pull that back up. <clears throat> okay, it says... The absurdity of the world's superpower undercutting the only Western-style democracy in the Middle East would be laughable if it weren't deadly serious for this country, <clears throat> excuse me, Israel and the rest of the world. At this very moment, government officials whose salaries are paid by American taxpayers are actually cooking up ways to harm America's relationship with an ally that serves as a bulkhead against radical Islamist, Islamic terrorist forces in the Middle East and cooperates clo closely with us on a myriad Arenas ranging from intelligence, defense, and homeland security to agriculture and bit techno biotechnology. This is taking place as billions in cash from loosened sanctions flow into Israel, Iran's coffers. Into Iran's coffers, the centrifuges in Iran's nuclear facilities continue spinning. Tehran continues to stifle international arms inspectors, and America cedes the position of power at the negotiating table to the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Members of Congress from both parties should be deeply appreciative of the opportunity to hear from Israel's Prime Minister on the issue of seminal importance to both our nations. After all, the President's negotiators are holding secret talks aimed at producing an agreement that they apparently intend to foist on the American public with, without so much as a debate in the legislature. 
A bad deal is far worse than no deal, but don't tell that to President Obama, who seems hell-bent on supplicating to Iran and abandoning our stated goal of dismantling Iran's nuclear program. Talk is cheap and actions speak louder than words. What message do we send, not just to Israel, but to all of America's friends across the globe when we allow petty politics to undercut the historic bonds that have united us for, de for decades? This president should be ashamed of his treatment of our friend Israel. He has, trained, he has trained his sights on a crucial ally when we should be focused on our actual enemies. Let's for not, not forget who they are. The apocalyptic religious zealots in Iran who spent decades developing a nuclear program in secret that they don't actually need to produce energy and which they only come clean about possessing once they were caught red-handed by the inter international community. Our enemies chant death to America and burn, it, and burn American flags at public rallies in Iran. They support terrorist groups such as Hezbollah, which has killed more Americans than any terrorist group except Al-Qaeda. They provide arms, money, and moral support to sick murderers who gleefully target innocent men, women, and children all over the world. Those actions should be clear enough, but if the president and his advisors need some more hints about how Iran feels about America, they can note just last week Iran held military, mil naval military drills in which it swarmed and attacked a mock U.S. aircraft carrier with cruise missiles. The president is playing with fire, and if, and if Israel should ultimately decide that America does not have its back and that it must take action to defend itself against the threat of nuclear extermination, then President Obama will have nobody to blame more than himself. That is a very true statement. Love that article. Unfortunately, Barack Hussein Obama isn't listening. So it tells us that the Psalm 83 war, the Ezekiel 38 war, and wars, the wars that will lead straight to the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ are on the horizon. There will be no peace until Jesus Christ returns to earth for a thousand year reign. The Bible makes that clear that we're heading into Daniel's 70th week, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jesus said it will be so bad that unless he shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. That's where we're headed. The Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with many. The final seven years is about to start. So the question is, do you know that you are saved? If you do not, today is a day of salvation. You are not guaranteed another day. And Jesus Christ said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is your only hope, your only source, your only chance of salvation. And you can do nothing on your own to earn your salvation. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. Jesus paid it all on the cross and said it is finished. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Jesus shed his blood for you to save you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus gave us many, many, many prophecies to look for, signs that would show when we are close to his return, and they are all here. It is time to make sure you are ready. We are running out of time. He is returning soon. And this situation in the Middle East with Iran and Israel... And praise God that Jewish people are getting to pray, the court ruling that they can pray on the on the Temple Mount. That's huge. There will be a temple there soon. And Jesus is returning soon. Make sure you're ready. And keep looking up. God bless everyone.